This whole country just like my flock of sheep. Rednecks, crackers, hillbillies, house frows, shut-ins, pea pickers. Everybody that's got to jump when somebody else blows the whistle. <laughs> A Face in the Crowd just might be one of the most important films of the 20th century. Actually, A Face in the Crowd is one of the most important films of the 20th century. This character study is a personal, politically charged powerhouse of craftsmanship from every major player involved in its production. Additionally, it's an example of a changing style in Hollywood filmmaking during the late 1950s, a change that would precede the forthcoming American New Wave a decade later, even serving as a blueprint for the iconic 1976 drama Network, written by Patty Chayefsky and directed by Sidney Lumet. But I'll get into all of that in a bit. A common phrase I hear people say is, I don't know how we got here meaning today's climate crisis, wealth imbalance, food insecurity, and human inequality on virtually every level of existence. As a lover of movies, books, and television, I've seen the way these mediums have reflected the ways our society thinks and operates over the years, basically spelling out how we've arrived at the proverbial here and now. I believe some artists and creators simply have a clear grasp of how the world in their time operates, enough to foresee a future where those actions lead to dire consequences. And boy, oh boy, does Elia Kazan's A Face in the Crowd display the then and the now. Starring Andy Griffith in his film debut, Patricia Neal, Walter Matthau, and Anthony Francisioso and Lee Remick also in their debuts, this 1957 drama follows Lonesome Roads, a low-class, high-persona drifter with the gift of gab and boundless charm. When Marsha Jeffries, a local Arkansas radio producer, interviews Lonesome from a prison holding cell for her radio show, A Face in the Crowd, she realizes she has a star in her midst. Together, the two embark on a meteoric rise of success that spans having local grassroots democratic influence to corporate elitism that has the potential to affect global politics. Their relationship and morality gets tested by greed, lies, and delusions of grandeur, as Lonesome proves himself to be more sinister than Marcia could have imagined. Meanwhile, Marcia must question what she's willing to sacrifice just to be in Lonesome's presence. A Face in the Crowd captures sentiments around corporate greed, the media's influence, and corruption of power with such accuracy that it almost feels heavy-handed when viewing it today, considering we've experienced the reality of Lonesome Roads in many iterations over the past 60-plus years. While its message remains relevant, I find A Face in the Crowd further significant because of how it operates as a picture and also because of the era from which it emerged. By the late 1950s, television's novel rise as a popular form of entertainment threatened box office profits. Its prominence and the Supreme Court Paramount Antitrust case of 1948, which stopped all studios from owning movie theaters and inevitably changed how films were produced and distributed, were two major factors that ushered in the breakdown of the studio system. This breakdown of the late 1950s into the 1960s gave rise to the American New Wave or New Hollywood, where a burst of young filmmakers would take over the Hollywood landscape well into the 80s. But before this wave of films, there was a period in the late 1950s, following the post-World War II McCarthy-era Red Scare, where a number of films challenged the status quo, presenting more raw, honest stories often depicted through a unique cinematic style. While most people remember the 1950s as the quote-unquote horrible decade for Hollywood thanks to big-budget historical epics, musicals, and large-format pieces that flopped, there was a smaller movement of filmmaking happening that was a precursor to the independent wave that would follow later. I'll refer to this time frame as the post-Red Scare on the Waterfront effect. Silly name, but honestly, I kind of love it. Made in 1954 by Ilya Kazan and starring Marlon Brando, Rod Steiger, and Eva Marie Saint, On the Waterfront did what Psycho would do a few years later. It changed the game. Kazan and screenwriter Bud Schulberg's picture centered on a dock worker under the thumb of a local crime boss and conflicted over whether to inform after he is directly involved in a co-worker's murder. The film's political message is still hotly debated, in part because Kazan and Schulberg both accused of being communists and put on trial by Joseph McCarthy's House Un-American Activities Act, they both named names to save their careers. Despite this, On the Waterfront was a sensation and it's still considered one of the greatest films of all time. 
Like other films of this post Red Scare on the Waterfront era, On the Waterfront reflects a naturalism in its cinematic style and in the performances. The films of this era that I'm referring to have an almost pre-code Hollywood sensibility to them. They have an edge, rooted in challenging the status quo around sexuality and race, while also looking to speak truth to power and confront corruption. Simply put, rather than focusing on how a story unfolds, these films focus on the why of their characters and how the systems around them affect their motivations. Most of these films were also led by theatrically trained performers who cut their teeth on Broadway before appearing in film. Schulberg and Kazan reunited for A Face in the Crowd, and this time around, they made their message blatant without ambivalence. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Schulberg's script is one of my all-time favorites because of how it allows us to learn everything we need to know about our major characters within the first few moments of meeting them. Kazan, known for his ability to pull out stellar performances from his stars, is arguably at his best here. Not only does he allow his characters to have their boisterous, showy moments on screen, but he perfectly captures so many small, honest moments of natural expression. Neil as Marsha hurts my heart every single time here. Marsha is drawn to Lonesome's natural light, but gets burned in its heat, and Kazan, always one for capturing raw sexuality between his characters, lets us sit in the flames. A Sarah Lawrence graduate with a reverence for folk musicians, it's no wonder why Marsha falls for Lonesome. She is in the presence of a living folk hero, one who doesn't even know his own power until she reveals it to him. She shapes him into a man of purpose, which he uses to create absolute chaos. But Lonesome isn't wholly evil. He's not written that simply. In one of my favorite scenes of the film, Lonesome bucks the racist system of television in Memphis, Tennessee by bringing on a black woman he met at the 4 a.m. hour. The hour, he beautifully explains, is the dividing line where all that's left out are the folks who are in trouble. This woman's house has burned down and she has seven children to fend for. By the way, Lonesome says seven, but there's a scene that I think brilliantly contradicts this and shows how he doesn't let a fact get in the way of a good story. So he urges viewers to send in a few bits of change, which results in a collection of over $9,000 in today's money. In this moment, Lonesome has nothing to gain by this decision. Walter Matthau's mail doesn't need to tell us, but he does anyway. Hey, a colored woman in Memphis, that takes nerve. Lonesome reveals his genuine nature with this decision and when he says, Ain't nothing in this world you can't do when you let the best side of you take over. Lonesome is a complex man. His manipulation, his callousness, his bitterness, we don't empathize with those elements of him, but we see that they're the scars of a broken man who's been beaten down by a cruel world. He's a victim of the very system he gains the opportunity to control and manipulate. He's one of those lost souls who wanders around at 4 a.m. enough to even understand the underbelly of society. Even when he allows himself to be honest and vulnerable with Marcia, he can't handle the consequences. So he reverts back to his old ways, and his selfishness destroys the soft-hearted people in his life, while also empowering spineless snakes like Joey, who will run over whoever it takes to get ahead. Lonesome isn't just evil for evil's sake. He's a man unwilling to look inward and answer for his discretions. So he stays stuck in his ways, unwilling to change for the better. These moments of individual character analysis are coupled with a larger examination of society, the power of media, and how that media can be weaponized against us. Most importantly, Schulberg was able to grasp the complexities of a free market system and how it fails the people. Nowhere is that more evident than with the appearance of Vitajex. A research chemist hired by the company tells a business meeting of shareholders that the Vitajex pill is pointless, something that won't kill you but has no benefit. Vitajex could care less about what the pill does or doesn't do. They just want the profits. And Lonesome helps them market the pill as a wonder drug that predates Viagra and Cialis. He proves successful in a montage sequence made way ahead of its time, complete with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And this revamped music video slash marketing ad, the research scientist now tells the public that Vitajex has 97 units of energy-given Indraki. A fake word that makes no sense, but you get the point. Lonesome's corruption and ascension to power are made easy by an infrastructure that thrives on profit with little government regulation over the health and safety of everyday citizens. 
Eventually, we see that even lonesome is expendable among the elite vulturous politicians who want to manipulate the masses into agreeing to cut social services and other benefits for Americans just like lonesome. I love this movie so much. I know there's a faux pas around Kazan and Schulberg for naming names, but that doesn't take away from the fact that they gave us one of the greatest gifts to cinema. A face in the crowd isn't important just because it predicted the failures of corrupt systems, the rise of populist politicians, or the power of media. I think this film is among the most significant because it's a mirror into who we are collectively as a society. And if we don't look at ourselves, and I mean really look and see who we are and commit to changing, we'll fall trapped to giving society our worst instead of our best, just like Lonesome Roads. And look how that's going so far. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all the support you guys have been giving to these videos. I really, really love doing these. So please like and subscribe and share this with anyone you think would be interested. Also, if you want more insights from me, follow my blog, The Cinephiliac. I'll put the link in the description. And also, please buy my book, TCM Underground, 50 Must-See Films from the World of Classic Cult and Late Night Cinema. Link also in the description. Thank you, guys. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other.